DC, really. Um, and in April 2015, we launched Exploring Human Origins, What Does It Mean to Be Human, which is a traveling, a smaller traveling version of our permanent exhibit at the Natural History Museum. Um, and so that exhibit, that, um, that first phase of the project was two years long, and the exhibit traveled to 19 public libraries over the course of two years. Um, and in each public library, we had some um, public programs as well as some private programs for particular audiences, including educators as well as clergy. Um, and when that funding ended um, in April 2017, we thought, okay, well, that was a good, you know, first first uh, phase of our travel um, and we had an external evaluation team to help us figure out if we've met our goals and the answer is largely we have um, but we were really excited to basically have um, the next phase of our project launched last month when exploring human origins what does it mean to be human opened at Payne seminary um, so why don't i just leave it there and um, we can continue the conversation Um, so, to uh, another guest we have on Judith Adrian, and um, and who's your, who's your guest? Donna. Donna Hart. Donna Hart. Okay. So, so Judith Adrian is the co-author with uh, Jaren Morse of uh, this book here, In Warm Blood. She is his his representative and his close friend, um, uh, and it is because of the work she has done that we are able to to have this discussion. Uh, here at Payne Seminary, and, and uh, she's the reason why we were introduced to Duran and his his art and his 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 mission in general. And she's going to speak a little about Duran, and she can introduce uh, Miss Hart and talk a little bit about about Duran. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Um, I met Duran in 2010 when I was going to prison as part of a group that was meeting with prisoners there and got to know him and discovered that he's a pretty interesting guy, as you're going to find out very shortly. And he and I worked then on the book, um, in Warm Blood, and he's also an artist. In a minute, we're going to turn the screen so you can see some of his art here in this room. And we just continue to correspond. He's on, he just got a tablet about a week ago. And he's now on email, and the man is going wild. He's never had that experience before. And he's also able to download music. So he's a very, very happy person right now. Uh, and this is yes, Hello, everyone. I'm Donna Hart Turbalon, and um, I'll be very brief, but I will share how I came to um, know about Darren and his work. Um, I was attending a church presentation um, invited by a friend, and I was not aware that there was an art exhibit display that was set up uh, in the lobby of the church. So when I came in for the presentation and came upon the art, it literally stopped me in my tracks. I just was um, really overcome by the pieces that I saw. Um, so after the presentation, I found out that Judy was the person responsible for having the display set up the first time I met her. Um, I was interested in knowing more about Darren, and she said, well, we have this book. <laughs> and um, so I, I immediately was planning to purchase the book. Judy wouldn't let me. She gave me the book, and I think that's significant because if I had purchased the book, it would probably still be in the stack of <laughs> books that I've purchased and have not read. But the fact that it was a gift made me read it right away. And kind of the rest is history. My um, friendship with Judy and uh, resulting communications with Darren are um, all I consider to be a, a blessing. Let me turn the computer quickly so you can see the art display here. Yeah. That's for, for us to sit in if we want. Warren, is that working? 
Yeah, we're seeing it. We're seeing it. I'll just rotate a little bit. This is some part of the art. And these are the pieces that are not out at a show right now. And there's another entire show going on currently. So this is a, a sample. I don't like to leave them in my closet, so I, I put them out in, in this room. Wonderful. All right, we have a, a lot of people have joined the call. Um, he asked if you're not speaking to mute your mics. I've seen a, a, a guest, Thomas Nee. I don't, I don't recognize Mr. Right. Tom. Yeah. Hello, Thomas. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Susan, can you unmute your mic real quick in the classroom? We definitely wanted to see uh, see if we can get your students engaged in this conversation. Hello. Hey, Tom's difficult to his mic. I I do know that I can't get me. I'm down in the corner. Hello, Thomas. Nate. No, no, I, I muted his mic because he was on. He was on the phone. Oh, okay. He, oh, I thought he was calling. No, 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 no. He was on. He's on a personal phone. Uh, All right, um, Judith. No, leave your mic on. And Brianna, leave your mic on. Um, and, uh, yeah, Judith and, yeah, Brianna, definitely too, and Susan, if we can get your mic on when your, your class is settled in. And, uh, yeah, I guess we're awaiting, um, our phone call any minute from, um, from Duran. Is, can, can everyone hear me? Who can't hear me? If you can't hear me, Brianna, can you hear me? Raise your hand. Yeah, I can, yeah I'm good. I can hear you. Thank you. Someone, someone can't hear us. It's probably on your end. You can't hear us. Okay. Okay. It's All right. So, sorry. So, yeah. Um, where did we where did we leave the discussion? So, mm -hmm. where where is the discussion? Uh, well, we haven't ventured yet into. We we have information on many people, but we haven't had cross talk yet. Okay, um, so maybe uh, Bria or a student that from Payne Seminary, if they have a question for um, Dr. Brianna Pogner. Um So uh, as if everyone knows by now the, the underlying discussion of this uh, exhibit is what does it mean to be human? It's kind of a daunting uh, question, right? Been asked from from the beginning of, of time. Um, uh, humanity hasn't quite figured it out, um, but we're going to uh, pose that question. That, that's that's um, the nature of our discussion today. So if anyone wants to um, enter into uh, this discussion from the faith perspective, from um, the seminary um, vantage point, uh, because it is uh, designed to promote a, a conversation between what is commonly understood as a juxtaposition between science and religion. Um, so, if one of our theologians uh, care to to uh, ask a, a question to to Brianna, uh, we're, we're all ears. I, I remember a conversation with with Brianna. Um, mm -hmm. That Saturday when you when we were together at Payne, yeah. we had a long conversation, yeah. and um, you you probably, if you recall, better that that part of my view on the answer to the question, what does it mean to be human, is that in part we we are we are we are answering that question by the way we live. Mm -hmm. We. You approach it as if it's it's some fixed substance um, that is already set, and we are sort of working our way around it. I think, to a, a significant degree, given our evolution as human beings, it is it is the decisions we make about how we live. Mm -hmm. 
it's important mm -hmm. to the answer to that question. I'll simply throw that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that. I enjoyed our conversation and and you know, really the the this traveling exhibit exploring human origins is meant to be kind of a jumping off point to have this conversation. I mean, we can tell, you know, the scientific story of human origins, but um, there are so many other um, ways to answer the question, what does it mean to be human, aside from here is, you know, the scientific version of how we became human. And so I think all of the perspectives are really important and valuable. Yep. Oh, yeah. Susan, are you, you with us in your class? Oh, yeah, they're at lunch. They think there's a uh, little rambo just said to meet them. I, I saw them. They were really acting out. Yeah. Uh, does everybody else have any questions <laughs> for Dr. Pobler? Oh, we're waiting on Duran to call in. Or, or, or if anybody wants to make contributions to the, mm -hmm. to the to the answer to the question uh, <laughs> about being human. I'm curious to, to the, hear. The, the response. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll actually I'll actually probe, probe Judith and uh, uh, Ms. Hart on this um, uh, because uh, Judith, you've done a lot of work in, in a lot of um, different spaces uh, in the, in the um, in, in penal uh, system, right? You've been a been a college professor. Um, you've been been doing so much engaging work, and you've seen such a, a wide range of of human experiences. Um, do you care to to weigh in in the conversation about about what it means to be human from from your your vantage point? What your experiences have taught you? There's a thing that I was just reading, and it's called the Twenty One Questions. I'm looking over at the book, but one of the things the author is saying is that the way we can tell that we are human, that we're real, is through experiencing sorrow and pain. And I thought that was very interesting because those are real pieces, real emotions, and that is so central to a person's life in prison. There's physical pain, obviously. Um, they are many things are withheld from them. Things like color and beauty are not part of their lives. And in addition, they're distant from their families. Um, Darren has three grandchildren. He gets to see them about once a year. Um, his mom comes about once a year. It's fun when she comes because she is just dressed beautifully in flowing robes and with beads in her hair, and she's so glad to see him. And you can just tell she's been getting ready for days for this visit with her son. Yeah. Other people, people have followed in. We're still waiting on uh, Duran. Um, is anyone else from Payne? Someone, Payne Seminary. One of our students, Wanda or Bria. Yes, this is Wanda Burrell. I would just like to add um, what does it mean to be human? Listen to what everybody has said. I would like to also add in choices. You know, we have choices that we make. Either they're good, bad, right or wrong, um, and our choices affect our destiny of life. And also, I'd like to add in there, um, you know, for the young man, I'm quite sure they experience when they're in prison, like they're not able to show any type of affection, so it, their emotions have been affected. And that's important because we all need to have some type of human touch, you know, like a hug. A hug goes a long way. In, um, a smile, um, manners, common sense, all that um, comes into um, what it means to be human because it affects our everyday life. Sometimes the people, a person may not be able to speak, but they show kindness and compassion in their eyes or with their smile. And it's interesting looking at the paintings behind. I'm sorry, I didn't hear about what you say about the paintings. Hello? Hello? 
Sorry. Did it was frozen? Okay, they're trying to call in. All right, I think we froze a little bit. Uh, yes. They're, they're trying can you hear me? To... Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would also like to say about the paintings. I, when I saw the paintings, I was like, you know, in awe. Each of the three that we saw that's on the pain website is just unbelievable. But the last one with the young man sitting on the bed, that says a whole lot. Um, and I would like to know from the artist exactly, um, was he painting his life where he's at right then and there? Um, was he sharing his story? Because it looked like the um, room wasn't no bigger um, than what, six by nine? Yep, six by, six by eight. Yep. Six by eight. Okay. And it showed a lot. Like it was three pair of shoes or sneakers or um maybe like flip flops, a pair of sneakers and a pair of shoes there. That one picture showed a lot about maybe what he what he's going through because he's been here since he was seventeen. So that's been over what, twenty four years, so he should be about forty one now. Um each painting was unbelievable. And then the picture that he did of what Christ looks like to him was like Oh, I was ecstatic. I'm, I'm I'm wondering what has happened to, to Dr. Charles. Yeah. Um Uh, we, we we have a, a distinguished pain faculty member joining. You, you, I think you're seeing his back and his side. Uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Charles, you want to say something to the hello, group? Hello. <laughs> hello. Pardon me for running a little bit behind. Oh, you want it? Okay. He's, he's getting ready. Yeah. They're in the waiting room. Did I just add them? Is there a phone call? Yeah. Yeah, add. Is there a phone call? Oh, it's not a phone call. Yeah. All right, we're about to get the right on. Okay. Hello, Judith, are you back? Mm. Can she hear you? She can't hear I you. think you want, to, you want to go direct? Yes. Okay. Yes. I don't know whether that was where. Uh, well, the three of us can sit here, I think. Oh, okay. I think we can fit. Yeah, well, yeah, that's right there. I didn't know. It's okay. heavy duty, folks. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, oh, yeah, there's plenty of room. Plenty of room, plenty of room. Great. Ah. Right, so Dr. Charles facing us, and he's going to talk to us about himself, his distinguished self. <laughs> I was on in on the last conversation. Uh, I teach ethics here at Payne. Charles Brown is my name, and uh, I. Uh, what else? That's, that's about it. We we were sharing up, up our views 
our answers to the question, what is it? Preliminary answers to the question, what does it mean to be? Oh, what does it mean to be? Human? Yeah, preliminary answers. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's a preliminary, that's a question I should have had some previous uh, uh, awareness of. Um, we just figure you've been asking and answering all of your life, so we just... <laughs> yeah, but not in such distinguished company, you know, yeah, okay. something right. I've been, uh, I've been uh, playing around with, especially uh, with this, uh, with the um, moral autobiography and, and the various ways that students talk about their well, moral, de with. moral development experiences. I, te the, uh, I teach the introduction to ethics uh, <laughs> as a vantage point of moral autobiography. Uh, I use um, Proctor's uh, My Moral Odyssey as a touchstone. And of course, he, he draws on um, Kohlberg and uh, those people who do um, to do uh, human development, theory, psychological development, and all of that. So, um, students, I, I, I ask students to look at their own moral experience, period, beginning with uh, what defines as the moral entry, that is, the context in which they were born and, and, and raised as children, early adolescence, uh, as a kind of a foundation for who we become mm. as moral persons. Um, and one of the things that has been of interest to me lately is uh, the biological, how our biology uh, plays into this. And I don't know whether you saw the CNN uh, series, Three uh, Strangers, Three, mm. Mm -hmm about it was, it was about uh three about triplets three boys who were intentionally placed in separate in different uh foster home situations uh and they were tracking their development and what happened uh when they they met each other by facial recognition by seeing the resemblances and so forth uh, when they were 19 and they discovered that their mannerisms and gestures, both things, very similar. <laughs> but over time they discovered how different they were personality-wise and, 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 and in terms of their, their, their values. <laughs> uh, so that was, that was of interest, that's been of interest to me. Uh, we we become persons through uh, interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we are peopled. So <laughs> yes. we, uh, uh, so that being born with the physical characteristics of a human being does not necessarily mean mm -hmm. that one grows to become. A human being. Mm -hmm. Since that's a that's a that has to do with uh, with interaction and community. We have um, we become persons in community with other persons, uh, and we discover the value of 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 who we are as persons. And we sustain the, that value not just for ourselves, but for the, for each person and for the community of persons. Mm -hmm. and so that that's that's a long answer. But mm -hmm. that, that's sort of my perspective and orientation. Mm -hmm. That's Boston. Yeah, that's yeah. Per, per, person personalism. personalism. <laughs> I I got my doctorate at Boston. <laughs> And now I really regret that I have to sign off early, but I apologize. I have another conference call that I have to jump on. Hi, Betty. Um, but it was nice to at least be here for the beginning of the chat. And I'm sorry that I can't stay for the rest of it, but I look forward to hearing how everything went.
Oh, great. Oh, great. Thank you for thank joining. Thank you for joining. Yes. All right, enjoy. Thank you, Brianna. Right. Bye, bye. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> bye, bye. Dr. Holly, we're in, uh, as we as we wait for uh, Duran to join the gathering, we're just <coughs> talking about the theme of the exhibit. Oh uh, yeah! The, the, the central question: What does it mean to be what human? What does it mean to be And human? giving our two three cents worth. Oh, okay. Why well, does that what happen, Penny? <laughs> so, so give it. <laughs> well, I mean, so much that I could say that to me. What does it mean to be human? I mean, you know, one of the things, uh, well, I guess, things, you know, being able to be adaptive mm. to uh, my surroundings to, mm. to, as it changes, you know, as I put my coat on, I take my coat off. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I guess one of the major things, laying all jokes aside, um, you know, being able to uh, be a think to reason and rationalize. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a gift uh, to humans that no other um, being can um, can admit that they have. I mean, we have that ability to to reason and, and uh, rationalize our thoughts uh, and thought processes, which is um, a gift. Yes. Actually, I must say I'm fascinated with the way you put it. No other being can admit that they have. So then they have it, but they can't admit it. And so we, 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 we won't ever know it. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, yeah. I, just, That's I, true. I had to write it down because I thought, I've never heard it put it that way. They can't admit that they have it. That is true. Because, you know, to give an example, you know, because I can think about, you know, my, I have a, well, I have my pet dog. Mm -hmm. um, now, I don't know if she can reason or rationalize, but she knows when she's done something wrong. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know, when she's done something wrong, you know, she'll go and hide or put her paw up like this. Mm -hmm. And I, I say to myself, you know, what is she thinking? Mm -hmm. You know, is yeah. she really, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. But she can't acknowledge it in no, your presence. No, she can't acknowledge it, right. you know. Um, and I guess another thing, you know, being human, you know, is having a conscious, you know, that that lets you know um, but now somehow I just wonder if people, some people have consciousness, but they're just, <laughs> well, yeah, I know. If mine, they do, there's some, they, they make sure to ignore them. That's right. I mean, it's malfunctioning. And that's it. it. Yes. But I'm thank God that mine is in functioning order that, you know, when, um, uh, you know, as Paul said, you know, when I, want to do things uh, correctly, mm -hmm. you know, evil is always present, you know, like, you know, if you want to do something that's not <laughs> totally in order, mm. you know, if you listen to your conscience, you will, you will not, you know, you would, as you think, you know, have an ability to think, you would think about it and rationalize it and, and maybe not do whatever you were thinking of doing it, particularly if it's something negative. Because mm -hmm. we are all sinners. Saved by grace. Amen. So we do think negative thoughts every now and then. <laughs> every now and then. <laughs> Once every 20 years for me. <laughs> uh, now and then. <laughs> ah. And we have souls, you know. Um, now I don't, well, uh, that's, now that's a sticky question. That's a big that's discussion. A, yeah. That's a big discussion. So let me just so. let me step back out of that. You're right. You're right. You're right. Oh, Duran's there? What? What? Hello? Hello? Is that? I don't know who you are. Hey, this is, is Duran Morris. Oh. Hi. Hi, Duran. Good afternoon. Yes, I bless it up. Bless up, bless yes. up. Yeah. Oh, I hear you. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, indeed. This is, this is, I've been listening and, and, and unable to participate. It's been frustrating and exciting at the same time. <laughs> uh -huh. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, thank you, Duran, for, for joining us. Um, so um, we, we're going to give a quick prayer of thanks uh, for you joining us today. We're going to say thanks to the spirit of Richard Allen. And Amy Church, we want to say thank you to our ancestor Daniel Payne, to Bishop McKinley. We want to give thanks and praise to Jara Safari 
the yes, blessing sir. with the strength and the perseverance to go through what he goes through and still keep his humanity and his light intact. Yes. We thank you for bringing us together, all real world and virtual participants, for this engaging conversation about what it means to be human. We thank the Smithsonian and the Exploring Human Origins team. We give thanks to all of our ancestors and all of our gods therein. In your name we say. Amen. 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 Duran, thank you for joining us today, man. So um, you probably caught a little bit of the, the early conversation about um, the traveling exhibit, uh, exploring human origins. That's that's what uh, the event that has brought us here today. Um, you probably can't see uh, the, the the exhibit, um, but you are in conversation with the Smithsonian, and we have your beautiful artwork yes, framed in the background. Yeah. Um, so we're um, you're you're in conversation with about uh, yeah. say about eighteen or nineteen virtual participants. Uh, we have myself, you know me, Warren Watson, the Director of Library and Information Systems here at Payne Seminary. We also have Dean Michael Miller, uh, your, your brethren and countrymen, uh, dean, of, dean of the school, um, Dr. Charles Brown, uh, our esteemed faculty member, and Dr. Betty Holly, um, who is part of the Smithsonian Chair um, and was able to, to lobby for us uh, getting this exciting uh, traveling exhibit. Um, so uh, if you heard any of the back conversation uh, for the last five minutes when you were a silent participant, if there's anything you wanted to, to chime in on specifically before we, we kind of move the conversation along on, on some, some pointed and directed questions. Uh, sure. First, I would like to thank you all for having me. And I can see you all, and I can see the exhibit. It looks great. Oh, oh okay. wonderful. Okay. Fantastic. Um, but I, I think that um, you say that, you know, to, to associate being human with being, you know, with uh, feeling pain and sorrow, uh, I think that's a that's a part of it. But I think that um, I think that the word sentient is 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 what comes to mind. The consciousness is what separates us from animals. It allows us to you know appreciate a higher power, uh, you know, to appreciate lessons that can be learned from you know, hardship and pain and things like that. You know, in the painting, uh, the the, the, uh, the one lady was talking about. Uh, uh, called uh, 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 Dear John Letter uh, of the man in the cell, you know, you see a lot of, of the suffering and you see the, the, the constraint and the restriction in that, in that painting. But there's also, he's made a home. He's made, a, he's made his space there. Mm -hmm. you know, he's made his way of, of comfort in this, in this, 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 this you know, madness. Uh-huh. So I think that, you know, the having that conscious connection between, you know, uh, spirit and mind and body is what is what human to me. It allows me to appreciate all these various things and, and to do something with them, to either to take it. You know, uh, Rasta say that man is born with ten intentions, five good, five bad. And depending on what way his heart incites him, it depends on what will determine the path that he walks. So there's no such thing as a good Rasta or a bad Rasta. We're just all Rasta, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll start there. So how, how did you uh, come into Rastafarianism, uh, Darren? Um, well, it's, it's kind of funny because for for years, you know, I have my, my, my family's Jamaican, and my grandmother was uh, an odd mix of all sorts of religion, you know, Shango, you know, Voodoo, you know, and and Christianity, and you know, and Rasta. So you know, there was pictures around the house of Helis Alathia. And, and Marcus Garvey, and you know, there was pictures of Jesus, and you know, all these different things. And for as long as I could remember, she had been telling me to, you know, Rasta, you need to grow your locks. Jah gonna bless you, right? And I'm like, you know, it wasn't, you know, she she every morning she'd let her locks down and go out in the front yard and beat beat the rug with a stick and and sing praises unto Jah. And I was just like, man, this this wasn't my thing, you know, this was her thing. And and when I got in trouble for this for this for the particular crime that I'm in prison for now, you know, she would say the same thing, you know, that that, that there was a blessing, there was a calling on my life, and that you know that God was gonna was going to answer my call, and I just couldn't hear hear those words. And oddly enough, I was here in this prison in in uh, 1997, and I was in uh, I remember you know exact cell and everything I was in, and I had this dream. And in the dream, I was leaving prison, 
had these extremely long dreadlocks and the dream was so vivid and real that as I was leaving, I could feel the weight of the box. It was getting heavy on my arms. I could feel it straining and, you know, the, the excitement and everything that, that one would imagine that a person would leave a field leaving prison, all that felt real in me. So when I woke up and seen them bars, you know, it was just an amazing, you know, devastation. And a few years later in 2004, I had the exact same dream with the same intensity and everything. And when I woke up from that dream, I knew that I was going to be growing some dreadlock. And I said, well, if I'm going to grow these locks, I need to know what they mean. And so I started ordering books and started reading. And it was the first religion that I ever read or came encounter with that that didn't have shame and negative thoughts and feelings associated with God. I'd been to every religion. I'd been to uh, more science, nation of Islam, traditional Islam, Christianity, and Catholicism, and everything was about guilt and negativity. And there was nothing in there that was ever promoted peace or made me feel that there was... That, that there was an entity out there looking for me and wanting to inspire me and, and was not going to, you know, burn me in the fire for every mistake that I made, you know. Mm. And that was the path that led me to Rasta. And it's, and it's like the first time in my life that I felt any sort of real uh, purpose, peace, you know. Cool. So even today, when you're in such a, a, a grueling, um, you know, uh, uh, physical environment, right? You're, you're incarcerated, um, and to the extent that you you can you can speak to that, um, uh, not only the the physical conditions that you're in, um, but the you know uh, social environment that you're in, um, you know, politically. Um, the the uh, intersections of you know the, the criminal justice system and what you experience as a as an inmate um, to the extent that you can you can talk about that and um, you know give give light on how uh, your faith and uh, your art help you uh, to endure that that type of hardship. Um, if I understand the question correctly. Um I believe that, you know, in this environment, you know, as you may imagine, you know, for the last 25 years, I've been uh, confined in a, a maximum security institution, and uh, it's not the most positive place in the world. And unfortunately, uh, not everyone who comes here has the desire to to re reinvent themselves or, you know, change their path. So there's a, a an extreme amount of, of negativity here. Um, and unfortunately, I also believe that, you know, although there are good people and bad people in all situations, you know, whether they live here or work here, you know, um, more often than not, there's there's a, a huge amount of negativity that comes from all sides that creates, you know, uh, an, an extremely difficult place. And for many years, you know, I was a part of that. And, I, and in some ways, I still am. I mean, how can you, you know, you know, get in the water without getting wet, you know? So it's it's a part of you become a part of the culture you become a part of the, the environment and it's a, a daily daily struggle you know to to maintain any sense of hope any sense of of, pos of positive you know um, because there's there's not a lot of reward for for positive behavior or positive thoughts or you know or anything of that nature so it's you don't see real results, you know, like if you're working a job and you're doing something good, you know, you get a raise or your boss comes by and say, hey, you know, good job. In this environment, that that's very rare, you know, if, if, it, if it happens at all. So you don't know if the path that you're walking or if the things that you're doing counts or matter in any kind of way. And I think that having those sort of things, you know, uh, missing from, 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 from my life, has, you know, had a way on my consciousness and my, you know, and my being. But the thing that, that really makes a difference for me is uh, having a sense of purpose, feeling that I have a connection to this God and that this God is orchestrating this. And this, this is not all just by chance. That there's, there's some purpose to this. You know, I remember I was watching uh, the, the sister Joyce Myers, the, the, the evangelist, 
and she was talking about being sexually abused, and she was saying that she was praying to God, say, you know, why would you do this? Why would you allow this to happen to me? And the answer that she got was, how could she minister, minister unto the broken if she didn't know what it means to be broken? And so the things that she went through as a child was was her was 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 what she needed to to be to be a minister unto the people. And so I likened myself in that same way, you know. Um, recently, uh, the current my current roommate recently told me that of all the people he's ever met in his life, you know, including his father, and, you know, and so on and so on, he's never met anyone who's had an impact on his life, you know, uh, as he feels that, you know, the conversations and interactions that he and I are having. And that to me was, you know, it came in, the comment came at a time where, you know, I, I feel particularly challenged. And so it was, it was almost as if the creator was letting me know, don't give up. I hear you and I see you. There's a purpose for all this here. Mm. Mm. So you speak a lot about purpose, Duran. Can you, can you um, expand on that, your, your sense of purpose? Um, uh, you, you feel like it was it was your purpose to to be in a position you're in right now, and uh, is there a purpose? Is, does where you is there? Does your purpose lead you to an understanding of what your life might look like uh, outside of uh, incarceration if if that day were to come? Um. Yes, yes, it does. I mean, um, purpose. Um. For me, you know, as as many of you may know from reading the book, is that you know I went through some uh, some really traumatic experiences as as a young as a young person, you know, physical and sexual abuse, and and it's 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 weird because coming to prison uh, actually you know saved my life because I had no value, you know, I I as a physical person, I as a uh, conscious person, it, I had no value. You know, I felt like I didn't belong anywhere. I didn't have anything to contribute. Um, and I just felt, you know, valueless. And, and it's coming here, being able to separate myself from the various, you know, people that I was around me, the gangs and organizations and drugs and things that was consuming my mind and my body. Um, that was my first opportunity to really see something different. And it took a really long time. It didn't happen overnight. Uh, it, it took a really long time and some, some more traumatic experiences within the environment to really push me towards, you know, seeing something different. And the, the sense of purpose that I feel is that whether I'm here, you know, it was a, 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 um, a cliche that I had read and said that, you know, no matter what Rasta is and who you're around, Rasta is never alone, which is the term I and I. So, because if we're all pushing against this ball, you know, there's this ball we're trying to move up this hill. So huh. whether I can see you or not, I know that you're there. And I know that we all are moving towards a common goal, which is to push for uh, consciousness, spirituality, to, to reform, to, to get rid of, to chant down the negativity. And so in this environment, I am around people who have, very little hope who have had, you know, been failed by the system, who have been failed by their caregivers, who have been failed by the people who raised them. And and a lot of a lot of people really don't have examples of how to, you know, problem solve or how to communicate or how to do various things in other ways besides you know, using, you know, the, the most foul and vulgar language or, you know, using their fist. And sometimes I'm able to, you know, demonstrate through my through my own character there are other ways to solve problems there's other ways to live life and there's other ways to you know to be to exist other than what we've known and that to me so provides me with a sense of purpose as i stand right here today should god or you know the powers that be grant me an opportunity for for release i see my life as being an extension of what it is now just to a greater extent to a wider audience so let's talk about that audience. So right now we have, say, about 20 people on this call, um, many of which are pastors in the community. Uh, some are training to be pastors. Uh, do you have any um, advice, any suggestions to how um, uh, the, the clerical leadership 
of uh, the AMB community and, and, and all Christian communities um, could uh, engage the criminal justice system to reform it, um, to provide uh, a sense of, you said how many of the, the inmates feel a sense of being let down or uh, that they're, you know, others have, have failed them. Is there a particular set of steps uh, or some, some direct advice that you have for how we as, as, as ministerial leaders can, can engage the criminal justice system to, to heal those within it and to, to ultimately change it? That's a great question. Um, I think that one of the first things is to be present and to be involved um, and to be authentic. Um, a lot of a lot of the young brothers that I come across, you know, they, they they've been traumatized by so many so many people and experiences that they don't have faith in anything or anyone, and. The, the slightest, you know, I, I remember uh, when Bill Cosby first got in trouble, um, everyone, you know, just kind of turned on him. And it was like, to me, I really disliked that because although he had made mistakes and, you know, done whatever he is, you know, he had done, his message was a really great message. And I think that sometimes we as people, we forget to see people as people. You know, we don't understand, sometimes we don't fully understand that, we all have a life and we all have, you know, walked a particular path. And that may not, you know, have been the best path. And then we may not all, always have made the best choices. And so to remind people that although you are, you know, spiritual leaders and, you know, uh, uh, exude, you know, higher moral conduct, you are human. You make mistakes. And to, you know, to, to not be judged too harshly by those mistakes and those choices. Um, because I think that oftentimes we see people as, you know, uh, uh, you know, okay. church leaders as, you know, morally superior, you know, and so any mistake that they may have made is, um, if it's not put in the proper context and if there's not um, true ownership of, of those decisions and mistakes, then we see it in a negative way rather than, you know, how we should be viewing it. So. Yeah. You know, like I say, my, my, my first advice would be to be uh, present, to be involved, so that everyone can see that, you know, not only are you this person up in the pulpit, but you're also a person that you're engaged within the community. And I think that the, the example in the Bible of, you know, with Jesus, you know, he said, you know, when he said, does the doctor not go unto the sick? You know, right. the doctor does not stay with the healthy. He goes to the people who need it the most. And, you know, it's great that we go to church and we, we congregate with one another to rejuvenate and to replenish our spirit. But those of us who are outside the church who are broken, we, we're the ones who need you. Um, Michael Miller here. A special hold to you from, from, it up. from the hills of Jamaica. Yes, I. <laughs> um, a number of things that you said a while ago um, connected me to a thought I had had when looking at your art. Um, clearly, the, the aesthetics is, is powerful, and the, the spirituality that exudes from it is very, very sort of enthralling. But I'm also interested in the discipline, the, the, the discipline of, of the artist. And um, you mentioned earlier in this conversation about the way prison saved you. And, and I wanted to talk about the discipline part of it. Yes, we're human beings, uh, but the decisions we take and the, the way we orient ourselves um, is, is, is very important. How does your art contribute to this? And how would you expand on that? Um, to form a message for us who are listening to you. Um, I've been I've been drawing for for as long as I can remember. You know, I've all people always ask me how do I connect? And what's what's my connection with art? And, and it's my first form of language that I remember. You know, growing up, um, I was severely uh, hearing impaired. I wear two hearing aids and. For, for as long as I could remember, you know, the school, the elementary school, second or third grade, they started telling my mom, hey, um, there's something wrong. You need to get him tested. And my mom refused. And it wasn't until 
four or five, six years later, they actually threatened, you know, uh, to have Child Protective Services to get involved that she finally took me in and I got hearing aid. But for me at that point, um, drawing was a, a huge way that I communicated. My eyes were, I had to be able to assess things from watching. And I really didn't know to the extent of my hearing impairment until I got hearing aids. And it was then that the world sort of changed for me. And, and I still enjoyed being alone and having that conversation with, you know, through art more than I did with, with people. Um, coming to prison is, is much the same way. There are a lot of people here that uh, I don't really particularly like to be around and they don't really have the sort of, you know, uh, character or conversations that I want to participate in. So the only conversation that I can really have that's, that fits my needs or fits who I am as a person is through my art. And unfortunately, the, um, the various emotions and things that I feel, I don't have a lot of outlets that there are not a lot of people here who can, I can express them to. Uh, when Judy and I first began writing the book, um, we were talking about things that I hadn't hadn't talked about ever with anyone, and so it was I was having emotional reactions to these things, and um, I went to see a, a psychologist at the time at the institution that I was in, and she sat and listened to me very patiently and and heard everything I had to say and was very respectful. And as soon as I finished talking, she said, well, you have a, a history of manipulating women, and I would not be one of your victims. And all I was asking the woman was, how do I deal with the abuse that I've been through, and how do I move forward? How do I not be tied to it for the rest of my life? And this was her response to me. Uh, so I learned quickly that the environment that I'm in don't really serve my needs, so I have to figure out a way to serve my own needs. So it's not a matter of you know, discipline for me, you know, to, to, to be an artist. It's a necessity. It is, it's almost as if it's the air that I breathe. Without it, I don't know what I would do or where I would be. It is my direct link to my creators, my direct link to my own consciousness. It is, it is my, a link to the outside world. It's provided me an opportunity to talk to you all, people that I would probably never have met or had the opportunity to have this sort of conversation with ever in life. Uh, Charles Brown here. Your your statement about value um, really uh, interested, well, impacted me. I because you talked about feeling valueless, and yet that you overcame that. Being being in prison helped you overcome that. I mean, I was just wondering what sense of value of your value was did you discover in prison that you couldn't that you didn't beforehand um just just, just on the really basic level that as a person as a living being entity i uh, matter uh, you uh, know uh, before coming here um as i said there were so many things swirling around me and uh and various people wanting to use me in various ways that it, it it didn't feel like i had any sort of value and it was here coming here that 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 came about and so you know just as a person who exists in the world that that in itself was the value that i did, that i found mm-hmm mm -hmm. okay uh, well, I was I was putting that in relationship to what you just said about the uh, psychologist that you uh, had to exchange with, and it it struck me how we how, how as people we value ourselves often by devaluing other people. I mean, we, we are able to, we maintain our sense of, 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 that, of worth by uh, ex diminishing the worth of other people. Mm -hmm. And that's, that helps a lot of people to feel um, like they're not valued, even in church. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there, there are people who do not feel valued in their churches. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
I, as a kid, um, you know, each time I would come in contact with my grandmother, she would always tell me that I was a Jamaican prince. And unfortunately, uh, in the neighborhood that we lived in, um, being Jamaican was not, you know, now it's like uh, it's a cool thing and it's, a, it's an exotic thing to be from somewhere else or to be a part of something or, you know, this sort of thing, right? But as a kid, you know, the other kids teased us. You know, we had, you know, farm and goats in the backyard, you know, chickens in the garage. So, you know, and other kids, the other families would tell their kids they couldn't play at our house or, you know, these things because, uh, they, you know, my grandmother would put the mm -hmm. do in, in the food or whatever, you know. So for me growing up, it was a sense of shame almost. But she would tell me, you know, you're a proud Jamaican prince. That means something, you know, she's a strong man, you know. So, and and I couldn't hear it at the time because, you know, the things that I was going through and the things that I was hearing from other places. Mm -hmm. But I liken it to the to the story of Jesus in, in the Bible. It talks about, you know, planting seeds on the rocky soil or the, the, the fertilized soil. Mm -hmm. in, in the situations that I was coming through, there was rocky soil. But the seeds that she was putting inside of me, they stayed there. So when people say, well, how did you become the person that you are? I said, well, I didn't become anybody. I've, I've been this person. It's just the other things were in the way. Mm. So when I had the opportunity to remove those things out of the way and get those things out of my system, I mm. became my author self. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is Betty Holly. Um, I was just wondering how do you use your art uh, or do you use your art to um, enlighten other persons there? Uh, are you allowed to share your art? Um, how you come up with your ideas to others? Um, it's yes, yes, and no. There's there's also, there's a rule for everything in this place. Everything is a violation here. Mm -hmm. So. Um, there, there's not really a community space here, you know, uh, in other prisons I've been in that, that's been, a, you know, big pad places where we can go and, you know, congregate with other artists and things like that. Uh -huh. um, but in this place here, um, or just everywhere I go, I end up becoming known amongst the prisoner as the guy who paints. Okay. Because uh, people end up seeing stuff. People walk past the cell and they see me working on various things. So it, it, it comes up. And then, you know, of course, um, I don't do the traditional prison art where, you know, I'm not drawing clocks with hands and, you know, prison bars and things of that nature. Uh -huh. So people usually see my art and say, uh, well, what does that mean? Uh -huh. That opens up a, a line of communication. It gives me an opportunity to, to express, you know. And sometimes it, it starts with my dreadlocks, too. I have long dreads that go past my backside. Oh. And so people ask me, you know, what does that mean? Or what does that mean? And so that gives me an opportunity to express, you know, uh, my spirituality, my spiritual beliefs and how, and then that always usually leads to my art because I see my art as a part of my ministry. Okay. Do others ask you to paint for them? Uh, yes, but I'm not allowed to. That's against the rules. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Okay. Okay. All right. So, Duran, thank you for donating. I'll, I'll follow up with uh, Dr. Holly's questions. We'll talk a little bit about the art we have in the background here um, that you so kindly donated to to Payne Seminary. And you're actually the first artist we hope to to grow our art collection at Payne Seminary in the Ransom Library. And you are the fir the first artist to, uh, to 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 make it into our walls. So, oh man, that's awesome, man! Thank yeah. you. Oh, yeah. thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so, so much. much. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we'll talk. We'll talk about um, the two the two faith based ones, and then you could um, illuminate on the one in uh, you and the, uh, the cell, which is um, the more autobiographic piece. But um, there's one, uh, the, the the Jesus piece, the one directly behind us, is called uh, entitled uh, "Faith in the Savior," right? Yes. Um, you dedicated it to uh, Brenna. Yes, I. Yep, you dedicated to Brenna, and uh, there's an inscription on the back. Um, uh, Matthew 5 3 blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven right. being, and then in your words being sentenced to die in prison I opt to 
to live in love. Love will heal all. But I seem to always find myself, uh, is it fl flinching? Myself, yeah, flinching. As soon as the sun has dried out my garments, I'm wet all over again. Mm. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, they have lots of, uh, lots of blessings coming. Oh, I'm sorry. So this is oh, so the piece I'm referring to, uh, Dr. Charles Brown's. If you just point, right, yeah, right over your head. Mm -hmm. So this is the Matthew piece, the one where Jesus is walking on water. Mm -hmm. right. right, right, right. Matt, three. Yeah. So, so that's the inscriptions. Um, and so, being sent to die in prison, I opt to live in love. Love will heal all, but I always seem to find myself uh, flinching as soon as the sun has dried out my garments. I'm wet all over again. Blessed are right. the spirit. They have lots of blessings coming. So, you want to talk about the piece and uh, you know what what inspired you to 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 create it? Uh, the inscription on the back. If you want to speak anything about the dedication to to Brenna, uh, but yeah, just 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 speak on directly on this this uh, faith in the Savior piece. Um, Brenna, Brenna, and, and Eric, they're two friends of mine. They're um, they're actually Catholics, and uh, they come visit me here periodically when they can, and. Um, Recently, I had a, 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 a GoFundMe page, which you all contributed to. I appreciate your donation. Um, that, that helped me get uh, an attorney. And, and it's been difficult because uh, I'm not the most optimistic person in the world. I struggle with that. It's, it's a part of my faith that I really struggle with. You know, it seems like every step that I take forward, you know, to move towards something positive, something else happens to put me back into the negative and being in this environment I'm uh, I'm always at odds with 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 various people around me um I remember there was a, a time in the um in when I, in the prison I came came to for, uh, before I came here um there was a guard who was every time I turned around this dude was on me he was on me he was on me and I could never figure out why because I never had any interactions with him I, you know, I, I I try my best not to you know to 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 be offensive in my language or you know uh, I'm I'm usually very respectful to people, um, so I could never understand what it was about me that this guy was, you know, that he was he was latching onto, and a few years went by and he eased up and he you know uh, you know he was making a comment to me about uh, some of the younger prisoners around me you know and I wish they were more like you. And and me me seeing the the opportunity, you know, now he's expressing his kinmanship with me. I said, well, you know, let me ask you something. Now now that we're friends, uh, a few years back, you know, you know, this, that, and the other. And I asked him, you know, what was the problem? And he said that he said, you know, he said you got a particular way about you. He said you walk around here with your shoulders back, your chest pumped out, like you don't have a care in the world. And he said, it just bothered me. Right. I said, let me, let me get this thing straight. <laughs> Two, three years, you hounded me and was, was you know, at me because, because of the way I walked. You know, so these sort of things and these sort of people exist within this world. You know, and unfortunately, some of these people shouldn't be here, are here, and they have power, and they have the ability to affect my life. So... When I'm thinking and I'm doing positive and I'm trying to be, you know, the best me that I can be, I run into some of these things. Sometimes they're my own creation. I can admit that I, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm I'm not a delicate flower. Um, so, but sometimes things happen that's, you know, beyond my, beyond, beyond me, and I have to deal with the consequences of these things. And so, when I'm looking at the future and I'm like, man, look, you know, I'm I'm really trying to be hopeful. And it's hard sometimes when there's so much negativity swelling around me, you know. And so that's where that 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 piece came from. Um, that I was, you know, trying to convey to her that I'm doing the best that I can and being optimistic, and I'm trying to be better than Peter, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's difficult when you know you step out into that water. Jesus said, "Believe in me, mm -hmm. and you know, and you shall live." And I step out there, and then I get them first few steps, and I'm like, hey, I'm walking on water. And it's like, hey, wait a minute, I'm walking on water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so that's when I flinch and I get wet all over again, you know. Right, yeah, that's great. Back to responses to that. Yeah. 
You know, um, I, there, was, the, there was something that struck me about the, the, the blessed are the poor in spirit. You're, you're, you're attaching that particular beatitude to that, ex, to that experience. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, so blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall succeed them. For they shall, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven, yeah. Right. Yeah. And there's, there's a hopefulness in that. Um, because as I said, you know, I'm not the most optimistic person. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, I, I, uh, I know that, you know, they say that once you, you know, you, you've been baptized and you've been transformed, that your sins are, are, are forgiven. Um, I struggle with that, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I've done a lot of damage in this world, mm -hmm. and sometimes to people who did it, who didn't deserve it. Um, and so sometimes I look, and then sometimes there are people who I've done things to, uh, not necessarily, you know, the crime I'm in prison for now, but there are things that I've done in, in, in my former life that, um, that I struggle with, you know, sure. um, and, and I don't know how to put those things in perspective. Um, within my scriptural readings, it's, it says that in the Hebrew Nagas, it says that uh, the devil has only one power. And that's what he makes to germinate in the mind. Mm -hmm. um, he can't grab, he can't seize, he can't beat, but he can make it germinate in the mind. And it's like whenever I have this peace, these peaceful moments um, and I'm feeling good and feeling better, I'm being reminded of, you remember when you did this? Mm -hmm. You remember how you said this or, you know, these sort of things. Mm -hmm. and, and that guilt seizes mm -hmm. me, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's where the blessed and you know the poor mm -hmm. spirit. I'm I'm really hoping that mm -hmm. that even though I struggle with you know that aspect of my faith, that there is something for me. That this God that I believe in is still seeing that I have a good heart and I have good intentions, but I don't always do the right thing, and and sometimes you know that's led to you know some some horrific situations. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure what what I'm going to say means to you, but I I hope it, it has some significance when I claim on behalf of those who are here that that we don't always we are not always able to embrace grace either, mm. right? Uh, because we are not innocent people either, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and and so we declare things and we we try to live into them. But it's it's a lot for me personally. It, has, it is a lifelong process, yeah. mm -hmm. and 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 I fall back in 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 what in what I claim to embrace all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so if it helps, you're not alone. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it definitely helps. You know, um, because it feels that often because in the environment that I am I'm in, there are not many like me. So right. there's not. A lot of opportunities to, you know, the, in the book of uh, Proverbs it says, "Iron sharpens iron." Mm -hmm. There's not a lot. Of, there's not a lot of iron around me that I can sharpen myself up again. You know, mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of people who would, you know, oh man, look, let's do this and let's do that. And, right. you know, there's a lot of encouragement for the negative. There's very few who have genuine encouragement for the positive. You know, there are very few who are authentic, authentically trying to reinvent or recreate themselves for a positive, you know. So it makes it extremely difficult when you feel like, you know, you're this island just floating out in the middle of water, you know, and there's nobody else out there but you, you know. Mm -hmm. So it definitely makes, it definitely feels good to know that, you know, even people of, you know, your moral caliber have the same thoughts and struggles. You're among a community of strugglers, brother. Yes. Yeah, we're yeah. all struggling. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just add to the poor in spirit thing, because I remember um, all the way back when I was in seminary, and that was quite a while ago. This would have been uh, uh, maybe all, all between about 55 years ago, um, that one of my professors did a sermon on that text 
and emphasis was on the fact that when we are aware of our spiritual poverty and we address God with that or address that to God that it gives us the opportunity to be more enriched spiritually mm -hmm. um, and so that was that was sort of what I was hearing as well in your choice mm -hmm. of that scripture to attach to that situation mm -hmm. Well, you know, if you look at that, that, that's dead on point, you know, and, and one of the things that I, I always try to, to remind myself is that when I look at many of the great people of the Bible, they were flawed individuals. Mm -hmm. Moses was a murderer. David was a murderer and, and, and some old things. Yeah. Solomon, you know, had his issues. You know, everybody had these, you know, these issues that they had to, you know, overcome and deal with. And and so I look at that and I try to remind myself that I am one of many, you know. Mm -hmm. And it must be something within those of us who have been tainted or broken. Mm -hmm. There's something in us that's different that allows us to take these things and 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 demonstrate, you know. To a higher to a higher degree, you know, it makes. I don't know if it gives us more authenticity, you know, if it gives uh, the person who's receiving it, you know, I don't know what it is, but it's something about us that it seems that um, that God seems to like to to use us, you know, in in these ways. And I, like I said, I believe that my paintbrush has been a part of my ministry. Yeah, you know, I have the ability to see things and retain the images. Yes. And to, you know, when I, when people are talking and when I'm reading things, um, you know, I've talked to other people and they, they, they describe when they read, they're thinking about what the words represent and how they, you know, how they define the words on, and how they, you know, I struggle with reading in, on that way. Um, for me, reading has to, cre it creates a picture. When people are talking uh, and, and describing something to me, I visualize it. It's not a word thing for me. It's a visual thing. Mm. So, it's something that, like I said, it's always been a part of who I am. So I, I don't know how to else put it, but it's it's definitely a part of my ministry. So that brokenness, which is, which allowed me to you know see see you know tap into that, you know all goes in there together. Uh -huh. As I look, this is Betty Holly again. As I look at the painting, um, the um. If, if, does she know which one I'm designating? Yeah. Okay, as I look at the painting I, that with Peter and look like Jesus, um, in the boat. Now, am I looking wrong? Are some of those people women, or all of them are men? No, no, no they all they all men. They all men. Oh, they all men. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. But I I did I did um I did intentionally try to use different um expressions mm -hmm. as as i imagine you know it's like you know when you see a car crash or something like that and there's 10 witnesses to this thing no one all sees the same thing because they're not always witnessing or having the same viewpoint so i can't imagine that all of the disciples had the same expression or reaction to seeing you know peter walk on the water or jesus walk on the water mm -hmm. you know so i try to as well <laughs> right because the reason i asked because it looked like uh the, the 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 man with the hat i thought that was a sister with a nice hat on <laughs> and i said mine that's that's different <laughs> but, but you i'm looking wrong okay that's the revised version <laughs> <laughs> so Jared, let's, let's talk about the other piece actually um the jesus crown of thorns yeah. uh, so uh, you know, February is Black History Month, um, mm -hmm. and in part of our celebration of, of Black History Month, we're we're uh, celebrating the um, the the negritude, if you will, or the 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 African centeredness of this exploring human origins exhibit. Um, it has been to uh, 19 other libraries, but this is the first time it's at um, a private institution. The first time it's at a historically black college and university. So we are we are very proud in the fact that we are. 
We are um, celebrating our uh, African ancestry, right? The, the, um, uh, all, all human life uh, began in Africa. The right. of, of modern man uh, was on the African continent. And so uh, that is a, a uh, underlying conversation to the fact that this uh, Exploring Human Origins I exhibit is here. Um, so uh, I, we did uh, think everyone uh, can, can, can note that you, you painted Jesus as a, as a black man, as a, as a person of color. Um, uh, we here at Paint Theological Seminary like to um, uh, live in the spirit of, of black liberation theology. Uh, we do not separate uh, the, the struggles of our, of our, of our race from, from our, our uh, theological uh, uh, disposition. Um, so uh, I guess this is a, a, a twofold question. Um, and uh, one is, uh, you know, why did you choose to paint Jesus black? And what do you say to uh, those who um, uh, would uh, cast Jesus in, a, in, a, in another less melanated light? <laughs> um, and uh, to what extent does um, your uh, Rastafarianism uh, invoke uh, the, um, uh, let's say, the, the scientific um, um, origins of man being of Africa, Rastafarianism being a very, right, a pan-African and the African have a, a, a very, very African-centered um, ethos to it. Um, to what extent does the, the paleoanthropological, uh, you know, pro progression that, that is uh, evolution uh, in inform your, your Rastafarian religion? Um, first, I would like, you know, uh, compliment you on the very delicate way in which you phrase that. <laughs> uh, and second, um, I think that um, one, of the, one of the things that really, really struck me about Rasta was that I had always thought it was a Jamaican thing, you know, because it was the way I associated with it through my grandmother. And so the more I read and learned on my own, I learned that, you know, here it was the, the cradle of civilization. It was a, a program I seen on PBS. It was a, a genealogist who was a, a white guy from Germany, and uh, he was he was talking about the bones of Lucy, uh, the the, uh, the sister from from Africa. Yeah. And he was saying that he he strongly disagreed that you know civilization started in in Africa, and that he was set out to prove you know that it started from somewhere else. So yeah. he used his craft. You know, he was a, a genealogist, and this was his field. And so he was able to, 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 to find that the, the original genetic sequence, the first four letters in the genetic sequence, you know, he kept seeing it over and over and over again, all these different people he was extracting DNA from. And he found that, that this DNA was re related to the first man, you know, on earth. And it was an African DNA. And he found it, he found a tribe in Africa that, that, that had this DNA. And from there he was able to show the path of man on this continent, you know, and how the next living relative to those people were some dark skinned people in India. And he went all around, but that, that to me was like, you know, more than the, the spiritual thing. That was more of a, like, that's concrete proof. You know, spirituality is about belief. You know, you can, you can believe whatever you want. There's all sorts of spiritual, you know, paths, but this was science saying, yeah, this is true. And here it was, this guy who, who set out to disprove this was saying, yeah, it's true, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so it was like that was amazing to me, and it just reaffirmed what I believed from a spiritual standpoint, you know, that, 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 these, that these people, you know, originated in, in Africa. And when you talk about the, the children of Israel, and they said that, you know, one of the things that the reasons why they, they wandered the desert for 40 years is that, you know, they had um, picked up these pagan beliefs and they were, and, you know, these were the things that was keeping them from getting to the promised land sooner. God was trying to root these things out of their system. So they, they adapted these cultures, you know, spiritually, but they didn't adapt these things, you know, uh, they didn't, uh, 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 um, co-mingle with the culture. There was no, you know, intermixing. There was no, you know, these sort of things. So that you would have to believe, even if you don't want to believe that the original Hebrew Israelites, which in my opinion is different from, from Jews, um, 
were of dark-skinned people. So when you see that these are the original people, how can you not say that, that these people were black? And when you look at the description of Jesus by John in the book of Revelations, I think it's 2.18, I believe it is, where he says his skin is the color of bronze as if it had been burned by the fire. He had hair like wool and eyes, you know, like coal. So, you know, the color of, of, of bronze is, is already like a golden brown, and then you burn it in the fire, it becomes really dark, a dark brown, burnt umber, almost black color. So that, to me, was another confirmation in the book of Songs of Solomon, when it describes, you know, O.E., sisters of, 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 of Israel who are dark as the, 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 the tents of Kedar. Is another confirmation, you know. So these things were, all these things were adding up to me. And then as I did more of a roster search of, about, you know, the, the Coptic church that where a lot of some of our beliefs come from and found that the first, the oldest Bible, you know, the compound Bible that we know of is, is, is in Africa. The, the first Christian church that we know of is in Africa. So how can we have all of these things that predate us as modern people that go back so far that that all point to this being you know, the, the, the cradle of civilization, this being where it all originated and so much centered around these people. How can we not pay some sort of homage to that? And I also believe that, you know, when they talk about, you know, for years uh, when I was, you know, a traditional Christian, um, one of the things that bothered me was that everything was, you know, painted Jesus in a white image. And although that I don't have a, a race issue, I don't have, you know, any hatred towards white people. But when he said, I come in the book of Matthew, he said, I come to the to the lost sheep of the house of Israel only. He said, it is not to take it is not fitting to take that which is meant for the children and give it to the dogs. So that to me was like, wow, you know, he liking, you know, I because at first I was looking at that like he was talking to me. And it wasn't until that I realized who the children of Israel were that I realized what he was saying. And then when I did a further story, a study and found out what these terminologies that he was using, what they actually meant, what they represented, it took root in me. It had a whole new stock in me. But it also convicted me in a way because then it proved to me that, that, that we are those chosen people. We are the descendants of those chosen people. So in the day of judgment, it, uh, it is us who are going to be judged first. He said, because I have created you as a, light, a, a, a nation of priests, you shall be a, 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 the light unto the Gentiles. So rather than, be, rather than being the teachers, we have allowed ourselves to become the students. And I think that because we have allowed that to happen, we have allowed that God spirit within us to be squashed by fear and other things, I think that we're going to, you know, there's, there's going to be a strong talking to, you know, from, to, you know, from God to us about this. You know, there's a reason why we have the spirituality within our people that we do. We're supposed to do something with it. And I don't think that we're doing all the things that we're supposed to be doing. Well, the, the Europeans who, from whom most of our images of Jesus have come, uh, we're not anthropologists, and they just, uh, when they image Jesus, they image Jesus to look like them. Mm -hmm. And they were not familiar with the fact that the land from which he came was a land uh, of, of dark, dark people. Mm -hmm. right. uh, Matthew records that... Uh, his parents took him to Egypt to hide, and that was before Egypt was right. inundated with Arabs. Right, right, <laughs> uh, right, right. Egypt was a part of Africa. Right, uh, right. So, is a part of Africa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Egypt is a part, of, but that's when Egypt was rec recognized, recognized yes, as yes. part of Africa. Yeah, because they tried to put it in another. I know. They tried to put it in because it had the the image of being civilized and right. of course africans were not civilized right so so what you are what you are doing is i, I expressed this in our last uh, session is actually uh presenting the, the images that 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 challenge this whole um misrepresentation uh that has that has occurred uh during the period of european dominance and 
and especially European dominance of Christianity. You know, uh, not too long ago, there's a uh, there's one of the women that I I, I, I uh, correspond with. She's a, a Catholic nun, a Dominican nun, mm -hmm. and she's white. And uh, I painted. A, she asked me to paint a picture for her, and mm -hmm. I said, "Well, of what?" And she said, "Well, you know, you choose." And uh, me being me, uh, I painted her a picture of, uh, of Black Jesus, you know, with these long dreadlocks, and you know, and with this white robe. And I was prepared for this, you know sort of backlash or some sort of negativity to come from, you know, this almost 80 year old white nun. Mm -hmm. And, and then, and I was actually surprised by her, her response. Mm -hmm. She said, well, first thing she said, well, she never really thought about the color of Jesus being relevant, you know, and because for her, he's had always been white. Mm -hmm. And so she said, she never thought about what it must be like for a person of color to, to have the image of God, you know, the, the, the physical representation of God on earth to be white, especially within a, a society and culture where uh, the, the, the voice of the people or the people itself is not positively, you know, uh, uh, represented. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it actually was a transformative process for her. Mm -hmm. And 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 it, it it was it was definitely it led to a very positive conversation, and and I and I showed her the book of Revelation and a few other places where, right. you know, I didn't just take these images out of my own uh, personal beliefs. You know, it wasn't just me saying, "Hey, this is what you know, this is where this come from," and you know, I was able to show her in the Bible that there's a root to this all. You know, even and it also led to you know. Because she was always talking about, why do I call God Jah? I said, well, you know, I call him what the Bible called him. You know, if you have a quick King James Bible, this is what one of the things that they refer to him as. This is the name in which he gave himself. Uh -huh. And, and you know, it was just like it, it led to a really, really deep and powerful conversation. Uh -huh. So in reference to something you said prior, uh, I'm gathering that you see science and religion or science and faith as compatible? Oh, no doubt. I mean, because when, when you read the Bible, I think there's this description of, of, of science within the Bible. Yeah. I don't think it was known by that term. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, some science has went too far, you know, when, you know, in the book of Genesis where God talks about the creation of the, uh, of the ass. You know, he said, you know, I, I didn't ordain this. This was not my thing. Um, and, and, you know, when he talks about the, the Tower of Babel, you know, and he struck, the peop struck it down and put the people in different, on different lands and touched their tongues so they couldn't communicate in this way no more. Mm -hmm. So I definitely believe that, you know, that science is not necessarily a bad thing. I think that we are supposed to be restrained in whatever we do by our spirituality and our, our moral compass. And I think that that is the problem with science, that it's going too far. It doesn't, it, it, it has removed itself uh, from, from, from spirituality, you know. But I definitely believe that um, we can't separate me because our bodies are, 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 are you know, you know the, the, the whole chemical makeup and how we, re if you look at how the body is structured and see it in relations to the earth, 75% water, 25% matter. You know, these things go hand in hand. You know, the water mm -hmm. hydrates the earth. You know, water hydrates our body. It, 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 it makes us fluid. So I see us as being patterned pattern or modeled after the design of the earth in, in many ways. And so I definitely see a connection. That was amazing, Duran. Thank you for that response. Yes. Um, so I'm actually going to, I feel like we got about another like barely 10 minutes left on this call. Um, so I was just going to ask a few questions from, um, from, from our uh, online audience. There's been a few that have popped into the chat room. Um, and then I'll let uh, Dean Miller uh, close this out. Um, okay. So um, one is we, there's a classroom of, of 14, 15 year old uh, males. Uh, on this call, and they um, were uh, they you piqued their interest when you talked about um, uh, the the neg negativity in your environment that you have to shut down, that you have to tune out in order to fulfill your mission, in order to 
to walk with your shoulders back and your chest out, right? So how, what is the advice you give to uh, 14, 15 year old males who find themselves <coughs> in negative environments and um, uh, you know, need to need to learn how to, to, to block that out or, or how to, how to navigate, uh, you know, a, a, a seriously negative, uh, negative surroundings? That's an awesome question. Um, I think that one of the biggest challenges is, is, to, is to be alone because we as human beings are social creatures and oftentimes to, to be courageous enough to walk your own path means you have to be alone. So when the crowd is saying, you know, rah, 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 your internal spirit, you know when you're doing wrong. Your spirit says this, we just saying what we're supposed to be doing. But it's hard to walk away from that. When you live in your true, authentic self, your authentic life, it becomes easier. You know, if you, and, and, and at 14 and 15, it's really difficult to stand out, especially in today's world. Mm -hmm. um, so my advice would be to, to do as much internal work as they can to, to, to figure out what their true values are, what they really believe in, and to, to understand that whatever time period they are in right now is not necessarily who they're going to be 10, 15 years from now. And to, and to understand that the choices that they make now are going, can, can, can positively or negatively affect the rest of their lives. So in, once you decide, I had written a book once, uh, one of my first things I wrote was the goal setting guide for the urban student. And in that book, I talked about when you don't have goals, you don't have a sense of purpose. When you don't have a sense of purpose, you don't have any direction. So you just, you know, can move in any direction. Uh, when you have that, when you have a direction, something that you're moving towards, then you have the ability to, to withstand some of that negative pressure because you say, what I'm meant for is bigger than this. Great, great response. Um, there's another interesting question in the, uh, from our uh, online participants. Um, they want to know what what artists do you look for for inspiration? Are there a particular um, set of artists, a particular style, a particular artistic movement that you feel connected to, um, or you know, or do you have a you know personal personal great uh, artist that you you try to emulate? Uh, Arnie Burns, without question. Uh, Arnie Burns was. Um uh, as a kid, my mother had said that, you know, she, she had teased me about being an artist because she said there were no male artists, you know, she said they were sissies. At the time, she said the word sissy, I didn't know what it meant. Um, and it wasn't until later on that I figured out what that word meant and, and how that was a negative thing. And going to the library, I found the artist named Arnie Barnes and it was found out that a lot of his art was used on the TV show Good Times. But I found out he, this brother was married and had a family and, you know, all these other things that was contradictory to um, what I had heard. And, and that, that art, you know, I, associate, I, 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 I associated myself with his art because it, it was filled with so much um, pain. And, and, you know, even when you look at the paintings like the Sugar Shack that they use on the uh, Marvin, Marvin Gaye cover, mm. you know, they're dancing but they don't seem to be having a good time. And that, that really drew me in. So Arnie Barnes would be one of my biggest uh, inspiration as an artist. All right, uh, before I want to know, Judith, uh, I see you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Hart, still, still on the call. I don't know if you want to, to weigh in just about um, uh, your relationship, anything that with Duran or anything that, that came up in this uh, today's uh, phone call, today's conversation that you'd like to, like to you know, chime in about. Yes, you So if you can come get your mic. Oh. oh, Rhonda. I couldn't hear any of that. Yeah, yeah, Rhonda, yeah we can't hear you. Rhonda, we can't hear you too well. Um, uh, so, yeah, we're gonna, we got, we're gonna have to mute your mic. Um, Judith, I don't think it'll mute their mic. 
No. Just look towards the bottom left where it says mute. All right. Well, we're going to turn to Dean Miller. Uh, Dean Miller, did you have any closing thoughts? Well, oh, wait, Judith, hang on. Okay. Sorry, Judith, are you there? So I was at Tuskegee University at one point doing some work, and I was in the library, which is a very good place, and the students were sitting at a table having a conversation by themselves. The discussion was, how do we raise ourselves up without putting others down? And I thought about that question for a long time, and I'm very interested in Duran's response to that idea as well. So how do we put, how do we raise each other up without putting each other down? Is that the question? So how do we raise ourselves up without putting each other down? Like how the security guard, uh, the, yeah. how we responded to you for walking tall. Yeah. Right. Uh, there, how, how do we build ourselves up as well as build up others to, to stand confidently, to stand tall? I think that goes back to, uh, you know, being authentic with ourselves and, and having the courage to admit when we feel invulnerable. I think that as men, we're taught that we're not supposed to be vulnerable. We're not supposed to feel threatened by, you know, anyone. We're supposed to be, you know, the king and then the, the, the warrior and, you know, all these other things. But, you know, it, being able to admit that there are times when we feel vulnerable, there are times when we feel threatened. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we're weak or that doesn't mean, you know, anything negative, but just being able to embrace that and, and allow someone else to be, uh, to allow someone else to be, you know, uh, a powerful, to, to encourage other people and, and to see that when we are encouraging that another person, we are also encouraging our own power. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I, let me before before I ask the question, I just want to express my own gratitude yeah. for having been given this opportunity to share with my colleagues, with Judith and and others in this very enlightened and enlightening conversation with you, Brother Mars. Yeah. Um, I want to begin and with with a, 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 two related questions. Um, when you consider your ministry. You've used that term on a number of occasions. Uh, when you consider your ministry, um, what is the significance of interactions like the one you're having now? And the related question, what are the most productive kinds of interactions people like ourselves can have with you on an ongoing basis? Um. Well, um, when I consider, you know, my ministry, I, I think about um, recently uh, there was a, a school, a school uh, uh, exhibit I had at a high school, and and during the high, during the exhibit, uh, Judy told me, you know, I, it was a phone conference, I couldn't see it, you know, we had similar sort of thing that we're having now with some high school students, and uh, during the exhibit, uh, a young girl got up and went into the hallway, and and she told one of our teachers that. Uh, because of my painting and, and the conversations that she was having, she felt um, empowered to let them know that she was in an unsafe, unsafe situation at home, and they were able to get her some help because of that. And that was, like, really eye-opening for me, that, that this was able to come from a paintbrush, you know, and that I realized that this, this was way bigger than anything that I realized. I was just painting my own truth. I was painting from my soul, and it resonated with other people. And I began to really pay attention to the people that I was coming in contact with where, you know, some of the prisoners around me who had read the book were, you know, telling me, you know, private things about things that they had been through and experiences that they had dealt with. And so I really began to see that this was bigger than just me and my own, my own stuff. And... When I'm interacting with, you know, people, you know, outside this environment, um, I, I think that, you know, authenticity is a big thing for me. I, I don't like fakeness. I don't like phony people. I don't have any time for it. Be who you're going to be. Say, say what you mean, you know. And so if you have, 
you know, don't don't make promises that you have no intent to, you know, to fulfill. Um, and I'm really about trying to move forward, you know, not only my own self, but, you know, you know, the consciousness of the people, not just, you know, there was a thing where they said, you know, we have to break, there was a book I read called Breaking the Ch uh, Psychological Chains of Slavery. Um, you know, not only do we have to break the, the image of, you know, the, the, the slave within our own self, but we also have to break the image of slave master. Oh. Slave master has to understand some things too. So it's not just a black thing, it's a black and white thing, it's a people thing. We all have to be in this together. So as as I look at it, you know, I think that we all, one, need to heal each other and and hopefully, you know, figure out a way to, to, to make the best of the common ground, the commonality that strings us all together. Mm. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. With any closing remarks, anything you'd like to share with us, Duran, about just you know going forward as a people, as a as a as a seminary? Is any any advice you'd like to just you know share with your 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 audience today? I, I would like to thank everybody. I would like to thank you guys, you know, for hosting this, the Smithsonian, for you know having the courage to you know to to as you say to be a part of the first you know black college, you know historically black college and. You know, to do this is it's a huge honor for me, and I really appreciate everybody who's listening and participating. And and I really hope that people become uh, informed. There, there are, you know, despite the negativity in this environment, there are some really amazing people in this environment. People, people who live here and people who work here. There are some really good people that that can really use your support and encouragement as we move forward. And I really think that you know it's awesome that you people are open to you know to this to this sort of thing. And I wish you all well, and I wish you all blessings, and I hope I hope I, that all the things that you have uh, before you, you know, uh, bear good fruit. Thank you, Duran. So, everyone, if you could unmute your mics, I don't know if we, you can hear our, 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 our round of applause from everybody for the writer is time. And uh, I'm give thanks to the uh, correctional stepping. Uh, well, I, uh, I would. I'm glad that you could be here today. We're grateful for your art. We're grateful for your your, your gifts of of intelligence and and conversation. And yeah, brother, just you know, we're 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 here for you. You know, we're we're not we're not by any means um, you're not you're not the forgotten among us. We we hold you in high value and high esteem. And every day that that someone walks into the rest of the library, they'll see your art, man. So we appreciate you. I uh, thank yeah. you. One last thing, I also want to you know to to give thanks and appreciation to Department of Corrections because. In the 25 years I've been here, that you know, this sort of thing is is very rare. So for them to 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 allow this to happen and foster this is, has been really great and amazing. So I, I definitely appreciate them. And uh, Cummins worked very hard to get this connection, man. He was he was very struggling in the beginning, so it was it was really amazing. So I definitely okay. like to appreciate so appreciate for everybody involved. And okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Department of Corrections. Thank you, everybody, on the call, and uh, stay tuned for our, our ongoing uh, events that we're going to have with the uh, Exploring Human Origins exhibit while this uh, Smithsonian exhibit is on our, on our campus. So thanks again. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Jared. God bless. Brother man. God yeah. bless. God right. bless. Yeah. And Mr. Warren Watson. Very good, sir. Very good.